Hello, everyone, and welcome to How to Write Unmaintainable but Wicked Fast Code on the JVM. I will admit, I'm a bit nervous giving my talk tonight because what I'm terrified everyone is going to do after this presentation is go back to your day job and try out all the tricks that I'm going to teach you tonight. And trust me, that would be a mistake, a massive mistake. Because first off, in most parts of your application, you actually don't need to write high-performing code. And even if you do, it's not going to make a significant difference on the speed of your runtime application. And second off, if you take these three techniques that I'm going to teach you tonight and implement them in your code base, your code base will probably increase in size by three to four times. No one will understand what's going on. You'll introduce bugs. It will be impossible to maintain, and you'll probably get yourself fired. So you may want to start looking for a new job tonight. And then finally, the last time I told someone not to do anything or someone not to copy what I'm showing them, that was the presentation I did on FP to the max. And that introduced Tagless Final to the Scala community. And you all know what happened with that. So please, this time, follow my recommendation. Don't try these techniques at home or at your day job unless you really know what you're doing and you really need them and you only need them in the hotspot. I've included a little legend here to help keep you on the happy path. When you see that little angel symbol there, it means, okay, this is good code. This is the kind of code you should be writing. It's maintainable. It's type safe. You can, you can write this kind of code and sleep soundly at night. On the other hand, if you see that little devil emoji, that means stay far the hell away from that style of coding because it has all of the problems that I just talked about. My top three tricks for performance optimization on the JVM are as follows. I'm gonna give them to you right now, and then I'll cover each one in depth, and I'll give you code snippets as well as benchmark results and show you what happens when you tie them all together. These techniques are used in high-performance JVM and Scala libraries. They're used pervasively in Zio and Zio streams and lots of other cool applications in the Scala community. Number one, avoid allocations. Number two, avoid dynamic dispatch. And number three, prefer arrays. So let's cover each one of them in some detail. Number one, avoid allocations. Let's take a look at code like this, harmless, good code like this, which is written in Scala, and try to find all of the different allocations inside it. Allocations, we don't even think about them in Scala, especially because in Scala, we don't have to use the new operator. With case classes, that allocation of memory is hidden. We're one step higher than that. Nonetheless, allocations are happening everywhere in Java and Scala code bases. It can be a useful skill if you're doing high performance work to be able to figure out where all the allocations are at a glance. In this particular bit of code, which gives all of the employees in a list arrays, there's one allocation that's quite obvious, and that's because it's the method called copy, which is on every case class. And this method creates a copy of an employee structure doing a shallow copy. Um, and, and so we get, because we're executing this copy inside of a map, on a list, and let's say that the length of that list is n elements, we end up getting n allocations from that e.copy instruction. Then the es.map instruction, which is a method on the list, is actually running through all the elements in the list, and it is allocating even more structures. So it turns out roughly you can count on this list map operator to allocate n things where n is the size of the list. And then finally, we have one more allocation that's not as obvious, and that's the allocation of the actual function, the lambda, the anonymous function there that does the mapping. That is allocated one time when this function is called, uh, once per function call, and it sends the E parameter to the expression on the right-hand side. So in total, this code does two times N plus one allocations, where N is the size of the list. So let's take a look at some code here that, or actually let's um, uh, take a step back and uh, consider the two major reasons why allocations, why I'm recommending you avoid allocations. The first reason is that 
every time you allocate something or Scala allocates something by calling new and allocating a new instance of some data type, it has to find memory on the heap that can hold something that's that big. And you have to remember that at any point in time, um, your JVM has done this a bunch of times, it's allocated a bunch of things, and um, it's freed up some spaces and whatnot. And so it, it, it might have to uh, find uh, a suitable place where it can fit that structure. And so that takes time. And not only that, but every time you allocate something, you have to free it. And freeing garbage collection does not come cheap. Even with today's garbage collectors, it takes quite a considerable amount of time. And even though we have incremental and concurrent garbage collectors, still they all add overhead. And the overhead comes from the fact that what the garbage collector has to do in theory is look over all the routes, the garbage collection routes, which are determined by analyzing all the pieces of memory that uh, can be inspected by any of the threads in the application. So every thread can uh, has certain you know, pointers, references to certain locations on the heap, and those create a pool of references known as the GC roots. And the GC roots um, point in turn to other objects, which are therefore reachable um, in, indirectly, transitively through the GC roots. And then finally, everything else that's on the heap that is a, not a GC root, nor a reachable object directly or indirectly from one of those roots is referred to as an unreachable object. And those are the things that can be reclaimed. And it sounds like it's a complex calculation. It, it actually has reasonably efficient and incremental concurrent uh, implementations, but it does take time and it does slow you down. How much? Well, let's take a look at this very sim simplistic example here where I've constructed a, a case class box here that holds an int. And I have this increment function that creates a copy of the box with a specified integer incremented by one value. Now, in, in this case, this my use of the, of the term box does not mean that this primitive is boxed. In fact, if you look at the JVM bytecode for this class, it's not boxed. This is stored as a, a primitive value type on the JVM. So just ignore that. It's, it's a box that holds something. So we, we have some allocation associated with allocation of this box. And then the actual snippet of code here is uh, or that I'm going to show you the benchmark result for is this allocate function, which allocates one of these box. And then a bunch of times it's gonna call increment on it. Um, so it's going to end up doing nothing more than incrementing this integer a thousand times, albeit indirectly by allocating all of these box structures. Now, the other way of doing this and the way that's most directly comparable to the code I just showed you would be to use a little known feature of Scala called anyval. Anyval is how you create a wrapper class for an existing type that will not involve allocation of the outside structure. Now, anyval does not work reliably. In fact, if you use it thinking that you're going to improve performance, you could be wrong and, and probably are wrong unless you benchmarked it. Any val is super sensitive, and there are cases where you can try to use it and end up with worse performance than if you didn't. So I'm not actually recommending that you use any val. But nonetheless, in this particular example, I've engineered it so that any val will do what it's supposed to, which is avoid the uh, expense of allocating the outer wrapper class and instead just use the inner representation, which in this case is an int. So this constructs the unbox and does the exact same thing as the other code did. This code is identical to the other code, okay? There's almost no change except for box to unbox and extends any val and not. Otherwise, the code is the same. What's the difference in terms of performance between these two implementations? A thousand times. So this code here is a thousand times slower than this code here. That performance difference is due entirely to allocation. Now, that said, don't expect that in the general case. This is a super synthetic benchmark. Incrementing an integer is something that your CPU is blazing fast at. So this is not a realistic benchmark in any case. But what it does demonstrate is that allocation has performance impact that you can measure. Pro tip number two, avoid dynamic dispatch. What does that mean? Well, take this example recursive function that transforms a list by a applying a specified function f to all of the a's in that list to turn them into b's. 
in this code, we have two places where we call a function or, or a method, as the case may be. We have, first off, this recursive call to transform list. This is known as a static dispatch. The terminology dispatch comes from the fact that we are calling the function. We are dispatching a call to a function. The term static comes from the fact that we know statically what function it is we are calling. We're actually calling ourselves. So the compiler knows that, and the JVM knows that. Every time it sees transform list, it knows exactly where the code is located for that transform list function. That's not always the case. In fact, it's not always the case with the other dispatch that we have in this function, which is the dispatch to F. So when you call this function F here, this of course is a method call, namely apply on a function one interface. That's how functions are done in Scala is they extend these interfaces and and we have a function of one parameter, so that extends the function one interface. And when we call it using the function syntax, that's actually syntax for a method called dot apply. So we're actually calling an interface method uh, of a method called apply on the function one interface. Now, the, the interesting thing about this dispatch is that we don't know in advance what hunk of code will be executed when we call apply. Why? Because it depends on F. If you pass in different Fs, then those Fs will be from different par parts of the code base and they will be associated with different code. And so you're basically passing in different hunks of code um, every time you call transform list. So we don't know from this code, from looking here, we don't know what code is, is going to be executed when we call F.apply. Not only do we not know it, but in a general case, the JVM doesn't know it because there could be hundreds or thousands or millions of different Fs that are being passed into transform list all the time. Every other call to transform left list, it could be a new F. So the JVM is not able to see that. Um, and, and all of the performance impact of so-called dynamic dispatch comes from the fact that the JVM ultimately, it has to figure out which hunk of the code to run. And it does this, by following a very systematic process, which is in some cases optimized so that it has no overhead. Nonetheless, you can't count on those optimizations in general, they'll go, they'll go away. When you do anything too complicated, they, those optimizations tend to go away. And so here's, here's our object F, and here's the method on, on that object F. And the JVM's goal and why dynamic dispatch is slow is to find out which hunk of code is associated with calling that apply method because it needs to know to jump to that hunk of code and execute it every time that dispatch happens. The process looks something like this. First, the class is retrieved from the F object. So that's a piece of metadata that's attached to every object. And then from the class, the JVM looks up uh, what's called a virtual table. And the virtual table can be thought of as a table that has a list of all the methods uh, associated with all of the interfaces and classes and so forth that are extended by that object. And, and then a straight up listing of so, sort of where to find those, where to find those implementations. Um, and then given the V table, uh, the JVM has to look up the method that it's looking for inside that table in order to find out the hunk of code associated with that. And then it has to execute a jump instruction to jump there. So you have multiple levels of indirection. Every time you do a dynamic dispatch, you end up doing several different hops. It's like, I think it's three hops in total in order to get out, find out where you're going. And that takes time. All of these are lookups. You might have to load memory that's not cached. Um, that might take some time. You might be waiting on that to happen. And so as a result, dynamic dispatch are, are more costly, noticeably more costly than static dispatch. So let's see what that looks like. Here's some code that defines a bin op interface right here that just stores a function, a binary operator function. And all of these different case objects here extend this class and they provide implementations here of this function. The add bin op adds the two ints to produce another int. The subtract bin op subtracts two ints to produce another int and so forth. So all these bin ops actually extend this common interface of function two here. And they do that just by delegating to this provide function and 
giving it the two parameters that it requires. So you can treat all of these binary operators here as function twos. And if you give them two parameters, you can, you can get back the result of applying that operation to the two integers. And then here's the code that we're going to benchmark. First off, we're going to bundle up all these binary operators inside this array, and we're going to just loop through all the different operators, and we're going to apply these add, subtract, multiply, and divide to some number. It doesn't matter what it is. We're just trying to compute something. We're, we're, we don't care. We're actually going to throw away the result when we're done. And then for um, how would we go about uh, writing this code in a way that does not involve dynamic dispatch? Well, here's one way. And, and this way that I'm going to show you is actually used inside Zio and various other places. It's a way of eliminating dynamic dispatch, but also retaining some of the ability to do something dynamically. It looks something like this. First off, we would define something like bin op type. And given bin op type being any one of these different objects here, which are uh, simple values, and given the straightforward definition of these functions, which I don't even have to write, these functions here are um, in entirely static, if you will. There's no, if you call add op, there is no dynamic dispatch associated with that because there's only one implementation of add op. And we know that because the keyword final is associated with this method. But also the JVM is able to understand that and see that, that there's only one implementation of this and it can take advantage of that. And so the emulation of the preceding code just looks like this. Our array, instead of containing all these binary operators, it contains the different types of binary operators. And then inside our loop, what we do is we um, pull out this type, and then this type is, is one of these different objects. We match on all the different possibilities, and then we delegate to the associated function, which the JVM knows statically. So here we are actually emulating dynamic dispatch by doing a match on an object. So we've not lost the ability, the same capabilities that we had in the preceding example, we've just changed it a bit so that we're no longer going through Java's virtual dispatch mechanism. That ends up being three times faster. In this particular example, it's three times faster. Now, this is something you can measure. This is something you can see if you're doing performance sensitive work, three times is enormous. <laughs> in fact, in, in an actual application, you wouldn't see three times because there would be lots of other, I mean, even in a hotspot, you wouldn't see three times. None of the, in none of these benchmarks would you actually see these numbers. These are purely synthetic. Nonetheless, they, they do matter, and you will see these techniques utilized in, in all of Zio. All right, so pro tip number three, prefer arrays. Basically, arrays are the only good collection type. All the other collection types are terrible. Why? Why is that? Well, first off, an array is the only collection type that, whose layout in memory is contiguous. Element number two is always next to element number one and number three, and so forth. These are allocated in just a giant block of memory. Contrast that with any of the other collection types, for example, a list, which is a linked list in which you have a node that contains a head and a tail, and, and those are stored next to each other on the heap but then the tail actually is a pointer to some other place on the heap. And then those uh, head and tail, assuming it's another list, uh, you know, a, a non-empty list, it, it'll have uh, those two things. And then that tail will point to something else on the heap and so forth. So, so you've got uh, basically a, a list scatters you, the contents of this collection across the heap. And that's very bad for performance reasons because it's not able to take advantage of CPU cache lines. CPUs are capable of pulling back more data than they need. In, in the case of arrays, they're capable of pulling back a, a good chunk of an array. And so as you're doing work on the elements of an array, the array is already stored in the CPU cache. It doesn't have to fetch that from main memory. As a result, you can perform uh, vastly more efficient computations with arrays than you can with other data structure that scatters uh, the, the elements of the collection all over the heap. In addition, arrays have another tremendous benefit for performance optimization work, and that is they don't box value types. So as you may or may not know, the JVM does not have a unified object-oriented model. It actually divides the world into two categories, value types, which are things like int and float and double and long and short and char and byte, and uh, reference types, which are things like strings and persons and other things. And every time you have a reference type, then you basically have a 64-bit pointer 
that points to something that actually lives on the heap. So when you pass a person object into a method, you are not actually passing the contents of a person object into a method, you're passing a pointer. Now, Java and Scala nicely hide that from us so we don't have to deal with pointer madness and the associated bugs with that. But nonetheless, uh, it still is a pointer and it's pointing to something that exists way over there. Whereas when you have a value type and you pass that to a method, you actually are, are passing the data itself. And typically all the value all the value types fit in like, you know, 64 bits or 128 bits. They fit in a tiny amount of memory. So it's actually not a lot of sort of copying that occurs as these value types are passed around. And what arrays give you the ability to do is to have a collection of elements of an int or uh, a byte or, or a string or any of these other things and store these uh, value types without any sort of wrapper type. You can't do that with a list or a vector or any other uh, collection type. And the reason for that is um, all these other structures, they ultimately, they have generic code in them. And all generic code after type erasure on the JVM, all generic code ends up needing to store elements of the collection using uh, an anyref in Scala, which is a Java Lang object. And so as a result, uh, all of the other collection types are going to end up um, boxing primitives. And that imposes severe performance penalty uh, in a wide range of high performance sensitive cases. Here's some very simple code that uh, creates a vector in this case of zero to a thousand elements. And this is the good code, by the way, this benchmark code down here, that, that's not what that angel is about. Don't write this kind of code either if you're trying to write good, clean, maintainable code. This is the good part. Everything else here is terrible. So it creates a vector with containing the number zero to a thousand, and it just sums it up in a straightforward way. Now this benchmark here is designed only to measure the overhead of accessing elements in a vector. That's why it's written in a super low level way so as not to have confounding factors. That's why the code here is so bad. In a similar fashion, this one creates an array from zero to a thousand and it does the same thing. It just iterates over the elements of the array and sums them all up. Now, I could have chosen any one of a number of other things that I could compare vector and array to, such as folding left or some other sort of thing like that. It, it almost doesn't matter though, because arrays are universally faster than vectors for all read, out, read operations. In this case, summing up the contents of the array is six times faster than summing up the contents of the vector. You, you simply cannot beat arrays. All right, so what if we were to take all of these techniques and combine them together in the same stew? What would happen? Well, let's say we have this reasonably straightforward code here, which um, going back to it, it actually reuses this concept of having a bunch of different binary operators. And it folds over all these binary operators with add and multiply and so forth. And it starts with this initial set of people who are all boxed into you know, this data structure here and stored in a vector. It folds over them all. And then uh, for every element inside here, so for every binary operator, it's going to map over this vector. And this vector contains people, so it's gonna map and it's gonna take that person and it's gonna copy the person and it's gonna change their age by applying that binary operator to the person's age. And it's going to change their salary by applying that binary operator to the person's salary. This is nonsense. It doesn't actually do anything that's meaningful in any business domain. <laughs> um, it's like the shining code you would write if you were in the shining. Um, nonsense code, but nonetheless, it demonstrates all of the sort of anti patterns that I've recommended you avoid if you're trying to write high performance code on the JVM. How could we do this if we were trying to write it in a best practice way? Well, we would have to, first off, we would have to get rid of this vector and use an array. Second off, we would have to get rid of this uh, dynamic dispatch. And then third off, of course, we would have to find a way to avoid allocating this person box structure. Because if you look carefully at this code, you can see that we're allocating in the copy. Namely, we are allocating a person because every time we call copy, it allocates a new person. And how many times are we doing that? Well, a thousand times every time we map over, over this people boxed. 
And how many times are we doing that? Well, that's however many binary operators we have. So I think it was five. So that's five times a thousand. We're allocating 5,000 person uh, boxed data structures. That's a lot. That's a lot of allocation. In, in addition to the allocation, we're accessing this as a, um, oh, we've got even more allocation because we've got the vector that contains all of these um, people and that is an immutable structure. So we're going to be doing more allocation with that. And then we've got the dynamic dispatch inherent to here and also hidden dynamic dispatch. This is the obvious dynamic dispatch that you can see plainly because we talked about this one, but then we've got more dynamic dispatch in this map operation. Um, and then uh, potentially, I mean, it, it depends uh, on on the, the call site, whether or not uh, the function you feed map will be treated as being dynamic. And then we've got also potential, potentially more dynamic dispatch happening inside the implementation of bold left with the function that we're calling. All right, so how do we do this? Well, here's how we do it. So here we have this, basically it's a tuple two, it's a product, it's a two-way product that contains an int and an int. If we want to move to an unboxed representation, then the obvious way to do that is to, instead of having a vector of people, we'll just have two arrays and one array will contain the ages and one, ar one array will contain the salaries. This is a trivial transformation that you can do in your own code. If you have a, an n-way product, then, you know, primitives ideally to, to re, you know, in, increase your performance gains. If you have an n-way product of primitives, you can break that up into arrays of primitives, n arrays of primitives. So rather than a collection of n-way products, you can have a product of n arrays of primitives. That simple transformation, there's an isomorphism there. You can go back and forth between those two representations without losing anything. That simple transformation will enable you to eliminate boxing as well as eliminate the outer collection and turn it into something that's much more high performance, namely an array. And then here we do the same thing as we were doing before to compute a binary operator. Uh, we just look up sort of I here and we see what type it is and then we uh, we, we do the different operations and so forth. And then uh, this code, it just, it, it becomes very nasty to look at, uh, but it's, it's two outer while loops. Um, it actually, in order to avoid dynamic dispatch, it stores um, this, which is a method call in here and so forth. And then it's uh, it's got uh, compute bin op in here. It's simply reassigning in place, mutating this array and doing that twice because there's two arrays. So this code is functionally equivalent to the preceding code. It does the same thing, only it's almost impossible to figure out what it's doing. It, it, and it, who knows, it might have bugs. It's certainly not gonna be as easy to maintain. And when you go to change this code, you're much more likely to introduce a bug than you are in the other code. This is horrible, nasty code that you should never write. In, in fact, I think a large part of becoming a good Scala developer involves learning how to not write code that looks anything like this. But Nonetheless, if you are in a, in, a, in a hot path and you need to squeeze every ounce of performance, then this is the style of code that you have to write. And you have to use null and you have to use casting and you have to use all sorts of other tricks in order to follow these three recommendations. All total, the difference between these two bits of code is 18 times. That's huge, that's monumentous. So we're, we're talking about you know, the difference between code executing in 10 milliseconds versus 180 milliseconds. That's monumental. Now, uh, again, this only matters if, if we're in a hot spot, but if we are in a hot spot, you can bet every single one of these techniques will pay for itself many times over. The way to know, by the way, is to benchmark, and benchmarking will help prevent you from doing premature optimization. Premature optimization is often said to be the root of all evil, Maybe that's not exactly true, but it, it certainly leads to some horrible code bases that are impossible to maintain. And the more performance optimization you do, the slower that code evolves and the more costly it is to change it in even minor ways. So resist the urge, even though it's it can be a little fun to write code like this and to really try to crank up performance numbers. Nonetheless, you are imposing tremendous technical debt and you are slowing down the ability of the business to iterate. 
you can solve your problem by throwing more machines at it, it probably makes sense to do that. If it's not economically viable, or if you're writing some code that uh, is going to be used by a lot of people, for example, Zeo or Zeo Streams or Zeo Tests, something like that, it makes sense to invest that effort and to pay the heavy costs associated with that low-level performance code. In many cases, though, it, it doesn't make sense. So what are my top three tricks of performance optimization? Well, to summarize, basically, they are do less work. That's the trick of making code faster. Don't do anything. You know, ideally, optimize by finding ways to not do stuff. And three common ways of, of doing less stuff, if not doing no stuff, is avoiding allocating stuff. Why allocate when you cannot allocate? Don't allocate. Don't allocate. Don't dynamic dispatch. So know what chunk of code is going to be executed every time you call a method. That, that means, I mean, a simple way to verify that is make all your methods final. If you can't make all your methods final, including methods, that means you can't use functions, by the way, because every time you use a function, you're extending an interface, which means that um, the invocation of that method on the interface is not going to be final. So, so you have to avoid all functions N nonetheless and mark everything final. That's, that's sort of simple bulletproof way to make sure that you're not doing dynamic dispatch. But you don't have to go to that extreme to identify cases where you have a lot of polymorphism and that's turning into uh, a dynamic dispatch that can be eliminated. And then, of course, prefer arrays. Arrays are the only performant collection type. All other collection types, linked lists and so forth, they're all, they all have terrible performance in straight up benchmarks and read intensive work cases. Now, arrays can be super fast for, um, for appending as well because you can have things like array lists. Um, their arrays are not, not fast for some write operations, for example, uh, prepending and concatenating. Although concatenating is actually surprisingly performant against um, many other structures for small arrays because it, when you're copying a chunk of conti contiguous memory, the CPU is very fast at that. Nonetheless, uh, arrays for uh, many performance sensitive applications, despite the few operations in which they, they do have significant drawbacks, like the prepends and the concats, they are way faster. They're way faster, and they benefit from modern CPU architecture that's capable of pulling in some extra memory um, and storing it locally on the cache, and so doing computation without having to do a fetch from main memory. So these three techniques together will enable you to, and also aggressively following through with the implications of these. There are many implications I did not talk about tonight. Like, for example, in performance-sensitive code, you don't use some and none. You use null. Why? Because you have that that you have that tool available to you. You have null available to you, and, and for anything that's in any ref, so you can take advantage of that and eliminate the allocation cost of using some, together with some dynamic dispatch cost that would come from using generic methods. So, so. All of these techniques here, even though they're very simple and I can explain them in 20 minutes, like you've seen, they imply lots of uh, different uh, concrete tactical things about the way you write your code that you will discover over the course of, of months, maybe even years, as you try to use these techniques to write higher performing code. All right, well, that's all I have for you, except I'll leave you again with that last final um, disclaimer, repeated disclaimer, to, to never try any of these techniques at home because you're you're going to write on you're going to end up with unmaintainable code get yourself fired make your coworkers hate you cause yourself to hate yourself once you have to maintain this code create massive amounts of technical debt that will probably torpedo your business and cause you your name to live in infamy among developers for generations and generations and generations <laughs>